Today we're going to be discussing uh, tips and tricks on how to negotiate a really calcified uh, canal. In this case, we're looking at a maxillary first molar. Um, the tooth is pretty heavily restored. It has a large amalgam filling and it has had a cuspal fracture. Uh, as you can see in the x-ray, the, the canals and the pulp chamber are very calcified in this case. And we're going to review techniques uh, that we can use to negotiate these canals and achieve a smooth and reliable glide path. So the first step is to make your access preparation. So right now I'm just removing as much amalgam as, as necessary. So I want to make sure that I, I cut back a lot of the amalgam um, so that I can allow light to come in so I can see what's happening um, and, then, and then remove as little dentin, uh, as little pericervical dentin as, as possible. Once I start making my access into the tooth, um, I really don't want to have to touch the amalgam again. I don't want little flecks and, and bits of amalgam to fall into the pulp chamber and into the canals. So I'm just making sure that I, I trim back enough at this point. So let's pause on this frame for a little bit. So now that the amalgam is cut back, we can really stop and take a look at the tooth and make a map in our mind where we need to remove dentin to expose the canals. Uh, so in my mind, the, the, the red dots indicate where I think that the uh, mesiobuccal, palatal, and distobuccal canals would be. So if we start removing dentin, layer by layer, we should eventually see pulp horns in those areas and eventually get into the canals. And if we connect the dots, we end up with a pretty conservative access that's going to give us enough room to do what we need to do. We're also going to take note of the color of the dentin at this level. So we can see the dentin is brown. Uh, and, and this is probably uh, because it was the amalgam and the amalgam was leaching into the and stained the tooth a little bit. Um, and we're going to see how this changes as we start to remove tooth structure. Now you can start to see the access taking shape. So this is what we had in mind. And we can break into the palatal pulp horn and see a little bit of pus. But we can tell that the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the pulp chamber still needs to be uncovered. And now we have the mesiobuccal and the distobuccal canals. And now you can see the shape that we had in mind. And take a look at the uh, pulpal floor. You see the, the dentin now looks like a glassy, has a glassy green appearance. So we know this is uh, tertiary dentin or a pulp stone that's on the pulp floor. Uh, we're going to leave it for now and try to see if we can get into the canals. I'm using a number 8 C file here in the distal buccal canal. Same thing in the mesiobuccal canal now. For me, this initial uh, filing basically uh, helps me establish the canals and uh, just to, just to feel how calcified they are. Uh, I'm not too concerned about you know making it all the way down to the apex at this point. I just want to get a feel if if my files will be able to 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 enter into the canals. And I'm going to be focusing on the mesiobuccal, distobuccal, and palatal canals only. And I'll be leaving MB2 until uh, I have enlarged the canals and, and, and basically put them back in the original uh, place that they were in. And now I'm starting to feel the apical constriction on this distobuccal canal. I know I'm close to the apex, I'm not quite through yet, so I'm using a, a, a picking motion 
basically a 25 degree rotation clockwise and then and then pull back 25 with apical pressure and then pulling back and just repeating over and over and over again until I feel that I'm, I'm through this apex. Now, you can also have the apex locator hooked on at the same time, which will give you uh, a confirmation that you're, you're in the right spot. So slight apical pressure, 25 degree turn clockwise and pull. Slight apical pressure, 25 degree clockwise, pull. And you'll feel a little bit of tug back as you pull back on the file. Again, giving you confirmation that you're, you're engaged in the right area and you're not creating a ledge. So same thing. Just by looking at the x-ray, we could tell this is a normal length uh, root of a tooth. So you're probably looking at anywhere between uh, 19 to 22, 23 millimeters. Um, so, so, you know, I'm not overly concerned about over instrumenting at this point. If I go through the apex a little bit, it's not the end of the world. And once we notice that uh, the files pass through the apex, and so once we feel like getting a little bit looser in the canal, um, we can start to, to, to measure. So we're going to take a preliminary measurement here. So we'll hook on the apex locator, pass the file through the apex, so you can see a little bit of red on the apex locator, and then, and then gently pull back on the file until the uh, reading on the apex locator is right at the bottom of the green. So once we, once we get it pretty stable at the bottom of the green, we're going to stop and take that as our preliminary working length of this distal buccal canal. There we go. That's our length. And we're going to keep using small files. So we're going to use six and then we're going to work up to an eight and then a 10. And, and you're going to be very, very careful not to advance too quickly. So you don't want to, you don't want to advance to the next file until the previous file is very loose in the canal. So you want, you want the six file to basically fall in all the way to the apex before you move on to the eight, and then same with the eight to the 10. And then once you, once you have a smooth glide path with a 10K file, you, you can start using rotaries, um, something like a pro glider or path files uh, are you know, very helpful in this case. So let's stop here for a second. So at this point, my file is right at the working length. The apex locator is at the bottom of the green. I'm confident with this reading. So what we need to do is pick a reliable reference point. So, so what I end up doing is I, uh, you know, detach the apex locator and, uh, you know, adjust the stopper so that it's right at the cusp tip. But I place my mirror on the buckle such that the buckle and the palatal cusps line up and I, I can sort of in my mind create an imagine, imaginary line that goes between the buckle cusp and the palatal cusp and runs right underneath the stopper. Okay, so I'm adjusting my stopper a little bit, and there it is. So, mesial buckle 19 and a half, MB1. And we'll do the same for the palatal canal, but in this case, the palatal canal is patent. The 10K file ends up being a little bit too loose for an accurate measurement. So, instead, I'm going to be using a path file. This is a number 10 path file hooked on directly to the apex locator. I'm going to give credit to my colleague Ted Damas for this technique. He taught me this and it's worked wonderfully. Now I have, I have found that this is the most accurate way to obtain a reading uh, once the canal is large enough that the uh, path file can pass freely through the apex. So here's the path file hooked on to the uh, apex locator clip. It's got these nice markings so I can do the same thing where I line up the buckle and the palatal cusps and I can see my reading is exactly 19 millimeters. Now that we've got our working lengths established, we can start enlarging the canals. Now there are various ways you can do this. You can use Gates Glidden, you can use uh, files that are you know, set specifically designed for coronal flaring. Um, I like to use uh, the same rotary files that I would, I would, I would normally use to instrument the canals. Uh, I usually start with a 35 and then I switch to a 40. 
and you know enter into each canal sequentially and all this is doing is creating a funnel shape coronally so this is my I've already used the 35 now I'm going in with the 40 enlarging the canals a little bit and making things easier for the rest of the procedure Once my coronal flaring is complete, I will start using a glide path file. In this case, I'm using the ProGlider from uh, Densply to my working length in uh, every canal. Just remember to use a lot of sodium hypochlorite so that you have enough lubrication when you're instrumenting the canals. We're now going to confirm patency in every canal by going down to our working length with a hand file. I hope everyone's really excited because next we're going to start looking for MB2. So let's pause right here and have a look. So first off, let's get oriented. So since this view doesn't allow us to see directly into any of the canals, I've labeled them on the screen. At the top you have the mesiobuccal canal, near the bottom is the palatal, and on the left side is the distal buccal. Next, let's look at the uh, colors of the dentin. So things have changed a little bit now, it looks a little bit more clean. Um, you still have that glassy green appearance uh, on the left side of the, the black line that I've drawn between the mesiobuccal and palatal. And we know this is tertiary dentin, and we're not quite at the pulpal floor yet, although we're very close. On the right side of the black line, you see a more opaque, whitish looking dentin, and we know this is where the MB2 canal is usually hidden. Now the MB2 canal could be pretty much anywhere between the mesiobuccal and the palatal canal. Um, usually it's located a little bit more mesially, so to the right of that black line. Um, and I've sort of drawn three X's, you know, the, the middle X is, I would say, where the canal is located most of the time, but you can have it closer to the mesiobuccal or even closer to the palatal canal, right up to the palatal canal orifice. So we're going to start removing this white dentin, starting from the mesiobuccal canal towards the palate, slowly, little by little, and we're going to see if we can uncover the MB2 canal. I like to use a tapered carbide burr that's end cutting for this purpose. You can use a chamfer diamond that's uh, you know a very fine grit or you can use a ultrasonic tip. There are different different tools you can use for this but I find that the carbide burr leaves the cleanest surface afterwards and it just makes it so that you can find the mesiobuccal canal more easily. So here we're just removing in that area always starting from the mesiobuccal and working towards the palate. Remove a little bit of dentin, rinse and have a look. So already you're starting to see a little white dot and you, you can assume that that's where the MB2 might be hiding. Um, oftentimes you, you don't get in right away the first time you do it so you just have to keep going that same line follow that same path and keep removing apically so I guess I'm feeling lucky at this point I'm trying to see if I can get into that canal with the with the C file no surprise the number eight didn't work so I'm stepping down to a six now a lot of people will use RC prep for this. I find, I find RC prep very messy, so I don't like using it. I find that uh, it obscures uh, my, my, my pulp chamber. I can't see the canal anymore. And if it gets on my gloves, the gloves get greasy and the file gets slippery. So I really stay away from RC prep, but I will use liquid EDTA. So once I can get the uh, file into the canal, uh, even you know two or three millimeters into the canal orifice, I'll flood the pulp chamber with EDTA. So I'll, I'll put the file in, I'll leave it in place, and then I'll flood the pulp chamber with EDTA. This way I get the uh, benefit of the, the chelating effect of the EDTA and uh, 
um, you know, I can see what I'm doing. So at this point, we have a pretty good idea of where the MB2 canal is located, but the file only passes about, you know, three to four millimeters into the actual canal orifice. Um, so I think the filing technique is key here. What I like to do is uh, sort of a back and forth and up and down technique. So I will, I will wind the file, you know, about 25 to 30 degrees clockwise, 25 to 30 degrees counterclockwise. At the same time, I'll apply apical pressure and, and then coronal pressure. So so I basically move, this similar to what an M4 handpiece does. So the M4 rotates clockwise and counterclockwise in equal amounts. So now I've just added a little bit of EDTA around the file. And it'll just keep going. We'll just keep instrumenting. As long as I feel that we're progressing. So if you look at the threads of the, the flutes of the file, you can see them advancing. So I know that I'm making progress and the file is advancing apically. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Check the file to make sure that it's not broken or bent. So again, I'm looking at that reference point, the buccal cusp and the palatal cusp, and I just I can see my flutes advancing, so I, I know we're going in the right direction. And I'm just adding a little bit of vertical up and down filing just to flare a little bit more coronally. And you'll notice I'm sticking to a 6C file. Um, you know, the, the file's working. It's, it's doing what it's supposed to be. It's advancing apically. So uh, there, there's no point to consider uh, switching at this point. So we're going to stick with the 6 until it's super loose in the canal and it basically falls all the way to the working length. That once we have the working length confirmed, we will, you know, go through the sequence. We'll use an eight file and then a ten file, and then start using our, our glide path files, and uh, then complete the case with the rotary instruments. So there's a six. Check with the apex locator. There's an eight and a ten. Rinse, and let's have one last look. So here we go. There's our mesiobuccal one, palatal, distal buccal, mesiobuccal two, and we're ready to do our rotary instrumentation and obturate. And that is all I wanted to cover in this video. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Ooh.